Oh, we really are. We really are coming up for the last video now. Things to do. Glue the nut in place. Oh, other things to do. <sighs> fit the tuners. Oh my gosh. Uh, zoom out, please. I'm going to fit the tuners. Line them up first. Being left-handed on a right-handed neck, there's a couple of tiny, mm, what you might call overlaps, but I'm not going to go through all the hassle of filling them because they're mostly completely covered up. Mostly completely. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. There we have everything. You go there, you go there, and you go there. I think that is everything lined up. Got strap buttons ready to go. Got the chamelo there. Okay. Oh, I don't know how well you can see that. I'm on wide angle, so you should be able to see everything. Get my marker thing, my guide. Guide drill bit. So here we are for fitting the tuner screws. So what I'm going to do is, thank you, basically I'm going to widen, enlarge everything a tiny bit. Uh, it's probably a different one I need, but I can't find it right this second. I'll work with what I've got. Oh, here it is. Is that the same? No, that's the same. That's a, this should be all right. Just to slightly widen the top of the hole. So we don't have to push too hard. <coughs> and then <coughs> dense from dense. Oh, I've lost it now. There it is. So we're going to put in these tuner screws. <coughs> then we flip it over. I think we're going to um, do up the do up the what we'll do up we'll oh yeah we'll glue the nut that's good a good fit <clears throat> I'll tighten these on the other side as well we'll do the nut glue the nut in place because it's perfectly fitted from yesterday as you remember then we will look at everything again from two different angles or three and then we'll think is this truly really the time to put strings on and of course if it is the time to put strings on then it's the point also <clears throat> at which we'll discover whether or not you go there please discover whether or not the um the wiring is worked as intended so as far as I know, now everything works, but until you put strings on, you can't really tell. So as long as it appears to work in the order that you've chosen, that is good. But it's only once you've fitted the strings that you really know, because you actually hear it more as an instrument rather than tapping a pickup with a blade. So that's always the <clears throat> scary final bit. Oh, and I've also got to put the strap buttons on here, so. Um, that should be fun. Now, the strap buttons seem to me logically there and there. I don't see any reason why not. Um, there's no real other way to do it on this. Um, <coughs> it might be it might be a neck fitting if it was a through neck, but it isn't with a bolt on. So. go. <clears throat> We're looking at it left-handedly now. That's strange. That's not what I normally do. So, okay, 
strap buttons. One there, one there. So let's make, make our mark. I've chosen some, <coughs> some strap buttons, so that's fine. Um, I'm gonna put it there-ish. Don't want it on the top, we want it to have a good grip. And then here, center somewhere <coughs> of this whole arrangement. So a bit of a pencil, a bit of a marker. We'll go, I do it by eye, frankly. We'll go there. Yep. And then we'll go down here. And we'll go, now where's our midpoint? Oh yeah. I think we'll go there. And I'll just double check those, double eyeballed. Pull up, nice, nice on the vertical, yes. Uh, center, 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 center. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's about right. That's about right. Perhaps a fraction taller, higher. Right, so now that's that. I'm now going to drill uh, pilot holes for these screws. They're going to be quite tight, but we want them fairly tight. And so the first one, oops, going to go in there, like so. Upside down, top, back, good. There we have it. Nice. What's this? Dust, thank you. Can put this one a fraction higher than I'd got it there. some black I've made me some spare leftover black felt I'm all out of black felt except this bit <coughs> was spare and it's got like it's got like a little central stub in it that one has anyway okay so there's my fairly bog standard style what what's it I mean why what's it I mean fairly bog standard strap buttons screws actually no strap button is the word I'm looking for these are standard strap buttons beautifully tight <laughs> and here glamorous I'm afraid. Come on punch out the middle bit. We don't want the middle bit in here. It's not coming out so I'm going to have to go through it. Uh -uh. Come on go through it please. <laughs> Difficult to do when it doesn't want to go through. Through into my finger. There we go. Uh, uh, I'm still running, or did I accidentally switch off? No, there we are. And then to here, here goes our top button. Hold oh, tight. Oh, hellfire. What's happening here? Are you bending? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you just bend? I think you blasted well dead. Let's get a shot of that. No, didn't bend. I went, pushed it sideways. Okay, my mistake. Panic, let's go again. Freaked myself out. In you go. Yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. <clears throat> right, 
So next thing on the list, we've got our repositioned pickups. We've got our thingy there, the thing being the bridge. We've got our spring, we've got our vibromate. We've used up, oh, there's a, there's a little detail here. I forgot this bit. It's a truss rod cover. That's cool. Spare bits out. Trust my colour and small screw. Where did they go? Three small screws. Okay. They look like standard, um, standard. Yeah, they are standard screws. Tuner type screws. These are leftovers now. Since I've used my own ones. So most of this. Oh, that can go in the bin. That's spare. Okay, so here we have. Yeah, I suppose it will do. It's not the best looking thing in the whole world. All right, I think the time now has come to put the nut on the end. And this, now having known how beautifully fitted this is, uh, should be able to just place this straight there and hold it down and glue it down and not worry. That's the plan. So, I've also cut it to length. Oh, what it probably didn't do was just to just round off the edges. I'll just do that now. Just take off the, take off the sharpness. I don't need it to be hurting us at all. So this is a short trip up here today, really. <clears throat> nice. Short trip. I've got a parish council meeting tonight, which is usually takes up most of my psychic energy on the days we have it. So I'm just going to basically do this, finish this one, take myself home and relax and do nothing much until a parish council meeting. So there's my, there's my, what's it? Nut in place. And while I'm at it, I'm going to just, um, and I'm just going to tighten these, tighten these one last turn. Now I've got them done up from the other side. This is, um, obviously I'm tightening them onto a couple of coats of reasonably recent uh, clear satin nitro. So they will might make a mark in it probably. Um, you'd have to leave it for several weeks probably for it not to make any mark. But even then it probably still will. Okay, there's our little thing. It's got a bit of a chamfer on it, which is quite cool. So it butts up quite nicely to there. We'll get it in its position and then we can mark the, the holes perfectly like so and then we will get those drilled same sort of same approach as the um uh what's the word as the tuna screws but with this i'm first of all i'm going to get my what's it spiker and make a hole right dead center in these before I drill just as a start point and then go back and give it another go. There we are. That just helps to locate this next one, which goes like so. And then we'll just do a little bit of over drilling to help these go in. Oops, stay where you are. So it's not too tight. There we have it. And so, we fit that like so. Lovely. What a delightful fit. Uh, it's going, I know it's, it's got white binding, it's got black pickup, um, truss rod cover, it's got white nut. It's a bit 
here and there, but it's good, it's good enough. It's what we've got, the best of what we've got. So, I think I was predicting yesterday, incorrectly, that yesterday's video would probably be the last one, but touch wood, eh, this will be the last one. Hmm. I could be wrong, I could be right. And it was interesting after doing yesterday's, um, it occurred to me that since I had all the video and timings of how long everything took, it would be a smart move to calculate whether my, you know, whether my sort of pricing of stuff like this was in any way realistic or whether I was, you know, shooting myself in the foot with my pricing. Um, Cause it's a difficult one. Everybody who does something, personal that they care about and something bespoke. I've never met people who don't, haven't had some sort of trouble, you know, with pricing and, and getting, feeling okay about whatever, you know, charging. Uh, it can be, it can be quite a, quite a challenge to nervous in less than confident self-esteem. And that's for all of us, by the way. I don't mean, you know, I don't think there's anybody who is just totally gung-ho and you know there might be some people who who've got experience of charging anything they like and getting the price paid because they're so damn famous that their customers will pay it but most people who do stuff that they care about in a craft sort of way hand makey sort of way um care about its quality and about how customers feel about it and you, very often the people i've met like this uh, are less than confident sometimes about the way they price things and it's a challenge so um i thought it would be good discipline to cold nosed hard nosedly uh, add up what time i'd spent and normally i don't keep a good enough record i just have a sort of sense of it but this time of course i i put, put a series of videos up and i was therefore in a much better position to account for how much time I'd spent on this, and also to factor in a, a couple of the stages that I hadn't showed that had also, you know, taken time. Um, so I did that, and um, the, the interesting bit is, I suppose, that at some point you kind of have to, you have to take a stand on your hourly rate, if you like. And I, lots of people will have those arguments where they say, well, you know, it's you don't do things by hourly rate. It isn't how it works. But in some ways, it is still because you have to you have to know what you're prepared to, you know, what what you can afford to do. Um, so, so here's my my, my vibromate attachment. This is how I think it's going to work. It's, it's quite challenging. Is this how it's going to work? That's going to come down over there, under there. That's only that's about the only way it will work. You're supposed to see the vibromate uh, thing. You've got to see it. The only other way it would work is to come at it that way, which comes over the top like that, which is no good. So it's got to be this way around. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so that was the the challenge really to to kind of put a a, a reasonable to, to uh, tally up the hours, be realistic about it, and then put a reasonable price onto it that makes sense for myself. Now, by the way, here are some here are some elixirs, and I'm hoping to goodness these turn out to be genuine elixirs, uh, and they've got some rust on the clear bit. So sometimes you, I've had some bad things with some of these but we shall see now i'm gonna trust this is the right way i can't quite remember but this seems to work pretty well <laughs> so i'm just gonna prop this up for a minute so it doesn't go anywhere and i can get my first string oh, i suppose i better line them all up yeah so anyway that was a that was an interesting process so i i have my idea of my sort of hourly rate now of course this isn't set in stone because my hourly rate changes depending on what other kinds of payoffs I'm getting from something. So, you know, I might say my hourly rate as a skilled craftsman is, let's call it 30 quid an hour. Right? Now, you, know, you could debate whether I'm a skilled craftsman or not, 
not. But let's say I call myself that. That's a fair, um, it's a, it might be a fair thing. It's, a, it's about a fifth of what a lawyer charges. Anyway, so if I call myself a, a skill craftsman and I, and I put a, no, a nominal 30 quid an hour, um, if you want to have my time to do something dedicated strictly to you. Uh, but like I say, that isn't set in stone because if I'm getting another kind of benefit out of it, then I'll obviously, the 30 quid an hour doesn't matter so much. I'll go, I'll do it for less and I'll accrue some other sort of benefit from, <clears throat> from doing the thing. So anyway, so based on that, I then worked out um, what I had charged and, and so on and where it ended up. Uh, and it turned out that at that sort of quote unquote hourly rate, I was about a hundred quid underpriced for, for this. And obviously then what it was clear about this was that the, whoops, wrong, wrong string. Uh, the, the underpricing was probably actually not underpriced had all the parts of this kit been decent and not required remedial actions. But as you've seen, a lot of this required remedial work. So, as a consequence, um, I ended up uh, kind of putting in, let's say, 100 quid more, no, three, three to four more hours on this than it should by rights have taken. And, the, and all of, all, most if not all of that time was probably related to fixing the things that were wrong with this kit, as you've seen, quite a number of things that needed taken care of. So, Actually, that tells me that the calculation wasn't that far off. My, my estimation wasn't far off. Um, and then I think the, the thing you, you kind of then think of is, well, um, you know, in this case, I, I'm not saying this to, you know, put pressure on uh, Andrew about the cost of this. Uh, you know, I, I set my cost and if I didn't really get it um, right or if I, I failed, from, with my experience, if I fail to anticipate uh, correcting bad quality issues that you get with kits, then that's kind of probably more my my fault than anyone else's. Um, uh, because you sort of, with my experience, I should probably recognise that kits will come with those types of problems. Anyhow, that said, so uh, yeah, good thing to do. Um, it, it allows me to come to the end of it feeling like actually um, we, we Andrew was we, we did try to have a conversation I said to Andrew um, I would be asking the kit maker for a concession or a, a discount based on the fact that as it was because of the position of the bridge the posts being three millimeters too close together this was unmakeable for an average worker you know an average customer so I thought that was that, that was, um, I keep doing the wrong one. Uh, that was fair to ask for some discount concession. Um, and I said to Andrew, you know, you can you can tell them it's at least a couple more hours of my time, um, you know, that, that's factored into it. And actually, of course, it's more than that, bearing in mind that we found more problems to deal with since. But anyhow, um, so if Andrew gets any concession given by the company, then he can give it, pay, pay me the difference. If not, we'll leave it as it is. Um, and generally speaking, I'm fairly comfortable that this has not been, uh, wasn't a mile off what I estimated um, in the first place. So that's kind of good to know that the sort of estimation was, was okay. Um, but it's a, it does bring up that whole interesting thing about how you how you do budget for something. And I had um, Alex come up yesterday to discuss a project for a family member, which I won't go into detail. But and in that discussion, one of the things that came up is that in the world of making guitars, um, uh, let's have a look. How are we doing? Uh, well, I've got a bit of. A, room both ways like it yeah so the, in the discussion what came up was the the fact that first of all a custom guitar built by someone like me will never 
the that doesn't look perfect on there but it is actually sitting well it's just the end of the slot that's got a little bit of a wibble in it but I'm not uh, I'm not unhappy about where it's sitting it's good um, yeah so we, we discussed the fact that custom built guitars can never be anywhere close to the low price of um, never be the low price of manufactured. Um, sorry, concentrating. We'll get there in a minute. Go the right way, Paul. Can never be the same price as a mass-produced guitar. So that's the first thing. Yeah, it can never be the same price as a mass-produced guitar. So that's the first point. Um, and, and so you have to kind of reset. And the question you have to ask yourself is, in having something custom made, what is it that you're looking for? What are you looking to have done? What are you looking for? And I guess the answer, um, really has to come down to some sort of value added which is either some aspect of customization that you can't get any other way um, or you can't get with a commercial product or some some sort of involvement perhaps of the customer in in the build process that you can't get and that comes again down to a mixture of choice personalization customization um, it could be to do with a particular look and feel that you just love and you can't get anywhere else or it could be um, to do with maybe something to do with the customer service that you get from having it made by a particular person that you also can't get anywhere else, etc., etc. So it's uh, it, it's you know you have to I guess you have to think really carefully about what it is that you're aiming for. Now this is interesting. Having fitted that and, and adjusted the balance now. Um, we need to go down with this a little bit. Yeah, so, so you know, getting people to think about what their level of customization is that they are after. And what's the, what, I suppose it's to, what, what is it you want that you can't get with a really good quality, you know, production line model. And of course, the point about that is that, you know, pound for pound, you will get you know, a much cheaper, good quality cost, um, production line model than you will get uh, pound for pound in terms of a custom thing. So, got to be really clear about it because the last thing I want, the last thing I want a customer to be doing is to be playing, playing, paying for a custom guitar which just ends up representing a very expensive guitar that they're not really quite sure why they got and why, why wouldn't they have bought a Fender instead because, because with a custom guitar as well, you have to remember that unless the maker is, by definition, very famous. Um, I need to adjust the truss rod. Can you believe that? Because I don't think I had tens on before. So, um, yeah, so, so by definition, the uh, usually a, cu a custom guitar maker is, uh, compared to the number of people making guitars, the maker is almost certain not to be uh, very particularly well known. Of course, there are a few that are and can command good price, high prices and you know, long waiting lists and so on. That's great and I guess that's where everybody wants to get to through a process of reputation and good customer service and great quality build etc. Um, but it's you know the, the sheer volume of people will be less known, uh, less well known people by comparison. So the, the point about that is that a less well-known brand, less a brand with less cachet, shall we say, uh, won't have the same kind of resale value that uh, a 
good quality fender, for example, will have. Uh, is this the one that works backwards, or am I? No, it can't be the one that works backwards. There is one that worked backwards, and that was Simon's, I think. So, I'm just going to use my this one to do this. Okay, so we are off to one side, and now we're going to put some tension in it to flatten it out, I think. And if this turns out to be the back to front one, then we'll find that we've created more. Now that's flat now, so a little tweak. Little tweak back. Now this is very subtle um, setting of the amount of relief. There's the, that amount. Back in your slot, thank you, and you. Oops. <laughs> What's that next to the check that relief on that side? Yeah, it's practically flat. Too flat. Slack off a bit. Now we're into we're into sort of slack in between the tides mode. So that's probably where it's going to end up. Yeah, little gap there. That's there, and that's because we're now too low. Uh -huh. So the, the kind of amounts here are tiny, as you probably guess. We need one and a half clear on this uh, base side. Well, beautifully in tune. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that whole thing of um, buying from a custom maker. What am I doing? I'll finish the sentence in a minute. Okay, so uh, I'll just take these down a tiny bit. Um, yeah, so so I guess the, the whole thing about having a custom built is, as a, I guess as a builder, you have to work very hard to help your customer be really clear about what it is that they're paying for. Because you don't, of all the things, you don't want some sort of unpleasant surprise where they're sort of they get to the end and, and they ask themselves why didn't they let's say let's say that you have a price tag of two thousand quid for a, a completely bespoke build let's say right two thousand pounds tops uh and then you know you, you could sort of look at what they could get for two thousand quid and then you know you, you don't want them for the you just it's not healthy happy for them or you to be in a position where there's any question at the end of it, like, oh, why didn't I spend two grand on a Rickenbacker or, or a Gibson, you know, uh, Les Paul or whatever. It, it, that's no good for them or for you. And just having had the money and got the job done, you know, isn't good enough. It, you have to do it so that they're happy with what they've got. Um, 
and, and that you're happy. So it's got to be satisfying for both parties. You have to be, you owe it to yourself not to kick off at a rate that is giving it away so that you maybe, um, like a lot of builders do, you just about cover your materials costs barely. And then realistically, you don't actually make anything on the labor that you put into making it. And while some people do that, and I've been guilty of a bit of that, and we've all probably been guilty of a bit of that when we start out gaining experience and stuff, um, it's not a good look for you or for your customer in the long run because they'll be getting something that you've done not as a business really you've done it as a maybe a personal learning thing and actually that that often can be less than ideal for them and even if it's great for them it's less than ideal for you unless you're completely clear about why you're doing it and what you're getting from it i.e. it might be experience and so on but even when you do that and you and the customer are happy then what you tend to find is that you contribute to an, an, all, an overall unreality or unrealistic um, uh, picture of costs and so when people look for how much something costs to do you might see you doing your custom build for 550 quid And I might look at it and know that you're doing that because in part you're new in the game or you're nervous or you're trying to get a name out there and, and all is very understandable. But I know that you're not making money on it um, and it's very difficult for anyone who is doing it as a living to make money on it. Um, I'm going to take this rubber thing off because really nobody wants to tremolo with a uh, Bixby with a rubber thang on the end. Okay, so here is our left-handed Firebird ready to go. And the only thing um, I really don't know about it just this second is what noise it makes. Um, and this is this will be the moment. Now, before when I first did it, I had a problem with a bit of I think cutting out because I had some uh, what's that stuff the copper sitting into the hole there and I made the mistake of um, trying to play it and it, that was shorting out so it wasn't working well <laughs> take the booster off turn the reverb off the presence is fine there it is okay a bit of power to it compared to what the bridge sounds like and then we've got a, we've got a bridge that's good that's the change of whatever that thing is series parallel um, it's quite that's quite I didn't check the um, output but it's quite low yeah so I might need to take the neck down a little bit in comparison. Um, I didn't see what the settings were. And maybe we come up a little bit with the bridge. Uh, I didn't check the specs of this. Um, what am I doing? What am I doing? I want to leave this bit alone and I want to do that bit.
So the um, series parallel gets louder on the out. <laughs> Do is I might just take drop the neck in a little bit more just as a balance and we'll stop it there the end of this video. I am a guitar behind schedule at the moment but um, that's okay because our Saturday band practice this week, I've got two a week, or two, two different bands. <laughs> I sound bold and grand but one of them is a wedding band and the other one is, uh, is uh, whatever it is, um, a band, covers band. I'm happy, that's this plastic companies come off those bits of plastic there, but everything else is good and ready. Do a quick push on the neck screws for good measure. That's good. Oh, that's back to front. That's not good. Do it the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everything good. Ladies and gentlemen, whew, I'll do a flyover because I don't usually do it. What are we? 41 minutes. I'm on good time today. A bit earlier than I thought. So I'm permitting myself to head back home after this. So here we have the Firebird, left-handed Firebird kit. Left-handed tuners, right-handed neck, upside down kind of, Morris, nice tusk nut, leveled frets. Um, they weren't great, I have to say, not very good condition. Um, these beautiful pickups, um, roller bridge, Genuine Bigsby, not fitted to the Vibramate, which is somewhere else, because it doesn't need the Vibramate. The Vibramate puts it too high. Um, so the brake angle is now happier without the Vibramate. So that's what we've gone for. Uh, two volumes, two tones. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is the only thing that came with it. And I don't know what happened in that kit where, where it didn't seem to be, to me, to be the... Uh, Bit of a, not the best. I, either something's gone wrong and I've lost the original thing in the move, as it were. But I don't think so. Uh, anyway, that's changeable in the future. But it's uh, it's functional. So all round, that's gone from that sort of basic mahogany-looking thing to what I think is quite a handsome-looking um, beastie. And you know, the the addition of the Bigsby is a nice touch. Um, I think I think the scratch plate makes the uh, makes the Firebird anyway. Um, if you were to do away with it, you'd have to put a round cover on here instead to house the switch. So as it stands, it's fine. Um, so yeah, overall, I'm pretty pleased with that. Like I say, apart from putting right the kit manufacturer's mistakes, that was that was okay job. You know, it it. it you know, if, if they pay up the perhaps the difference as a concession, then you know maybe I'll rec recoup the difference. But as it stands, if it hadn't had those kind of errors in it, it would have been nice on the on the mark estimation of of costings for that. So kind of reassuring that I'm not working for nothing. And um, you know, I think the thing that really motivates you is when you are, if you find yourself you've underestimated, uh, and you end up really working for nothing then it is hard to stay motivated to do you get the details right you know spending kind of lots of time making this look like the old barn caster complete with you know dark seams and stretches and bits and bobs you know even a little fill there look at that that's where the original jack socket was. oh that's why oh that's why it didn't come with one oh because <laughs> it was going to stick out of there badly and I've changed it to there. Fine, I understand now. You could have told me, people. So anyway, um, yeah, so getting it right, that's the other thing is getting the pricing right and being realistic, getting the experience to know when it's right 
keeps you motivated because you don't end up in that sort of, oh God, I'm working forever on this and it's still, it's not paying me anything. So that's one of the really important reasons to get it right, is so that you stay, it's a fair deal to you and you you stay connected and motivated to get it right for the customer. So this is going in the bag and it's coming home and I'm going home to put my feet up early. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this nine part mega series. I might do it again, a similar thing. In fact, I think what I'll do is I'll do the individual setups. Well, it's not quite the same. That's a bit of a refurb as well with the refurb. But I, I think I'll try and do this same process again with the next kit that comes along because and I've got a couple right down under the table there that Adam bequeathed to me. Look at those. One's a Les Paul Jr. and the other one's a something or other. And I keep forgetting it. Anyway, um, so it might be a good thing to do with kits because they lend themselves to rough and ready filming. I don't have to worry about the sound so much. I can just put the camera on a thing like this and just get on with it. Um, and it makes it easier for me because I don't have to worry about some multi-camera edits and stuff. But it is quite good to do that for a setup. So I'll continue with the two camera for the setups, but I think I'll just do, I'll do multi-part um, kit builds when they come along or that kind of refurby thing. Okay, so just a bit of variety. Thanks for watching. Uh, marathon, really, 17 or so hours in total. Um, you know, a lot of time. So see you again on something shorter soon.